Again, thanks for the stutter start here, and um, glad to be here. A lot of interesting stuff people are talking about um, today, a lot with uh, ArcGIS Collector and the mobile stuff, and um, I'm, I'm glad to see that Collector in particular has started to um, not suck as it did when it first came out. Uh, so they've got some, some competition with the triple um, app, uh, Fulcrum app on the mobile phone as well, field data collection. So, you know, competition breeds good products. So in a large part, that's what we're here to talk about. So today I'm going to uh, give a presentation where I have lots of slides with lots of tiny words that you can't read. I'm going to have lists of things that I will talk about. <laughs> to you. I am going to show a bunch of software code that is really tiny that you also cannot read. Um, wait, this went over a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> and today, what's that? It's okay, you're fine. Oh, okay. Thanks. You're, you're, you're kind, you're too kind. Um, and today I will be just making and ripping Esri up into tiny little pieces because they're just a big, awful, giant vendor and open source will rule the world. So none of those things are actually going to happen today, I hope. There might be a puppy somewhere in this presentation, though. So, so really, what I want to talk about in open source or hybrid solutions um, with multiple vendors, it's really just to drive the point that we're really in a transformative period here with NGIS. Um, for a lot of you that, that have been in this business for a long time, I think it's pretty undeniable to see things that are out there that are really kind of shaking things up. Within the Esri world, um, they are perfect. They continue to, to work out with ArcGIS in the cloud. Um, but there's a lot of other competition, a lot of other companies coming onto the the scene that started and were founded in open source. Mapbox, CardoDB, uh, to name a couple, uh, Boundless. And we'll go over a few of those uh, a little bit here today. And tomorrow, we'll kind of take a look at some of those things in action and how they can integrate with and work with your existing environment. Um, it's not an all or nothing decision. So open source is not an alternative to Esri, right? Open source is not an alternative to commercial grade supported software. Um, it's another option, and it's something you should be looking at uh, the various components to help fit your needs the best. Um, and open source is not just for those who like to tinker with software and get on GitHub and say, hey, here's that fix for that piece of code. Um, it's really for like people who, in my case, have a business to run. In your case, you have a department or an agency to run. You've got people to serve. Um, and these tools can help you do that. So in the end, I just want you to ask yourself, can a single vendor best fit all of your needs? Can the guy who fixes your dryer fix your car? Um, I just ask you to kind of think critically, look at the stuff that's out there, look at how easy a lot of it has to come to use um, and how well it can integrate with your other with your existing environment. So just a quick bit about myself. Uh, my background is in software development and IT. I've been doing open source software, doing open source, I guess, before it was really cool. Uh, 1988 was my first contribution to open source software, um, doing some writing of a Unix, Linux utility called LSOF, if there's any Unix or Linux geeks out here that know what LSOF is? Anybody? Damn. All right. Well, it's really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and you should thank me. Yeah. Um, so I have my undergraduate degree in computer science. It's 
spent most of my sort of first career working out in California in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, working at companies like Netscape, Cisco Systems, Intel, uh, Oracle. Um, and in my experience, they are servicing these companies. Open source software was part and parcel of doing the job to maintain those clients. It was not something we looked at as something else we might use if the stuff we bought didn't work. Um, we would get these tools, we would fix them up, we would share them with other people. Um, that's just how it works. And you know, proof of that is something like the Apache web server, which today is still the most dominant web server on the face of the earth, um, running on still the most dominant operating system on the face of the earth, Linux. Um, and so those things are part of your everyday life. So when I got into GIS um, about 10 years ago, it kind of struck me as a little strange, again, from my perspective, my background uh, was sort of the lack of open source tools, at least at the forefront. When I went through school for geography uh, masters, it was ArcGIS desktop, ArcGIS server, um, our instructor forced us to some AML. This was 2003, so um, he was, it was important to us to do the command line stuff. But I was just kind of curious as to why I didn't see these tools promoted right at the forefront to work with these other um, sort of major software providers. Uh, and so over the last 10 years, it's been great to watch some of this uh, happen and really start to take hold. Uh, just something I also wanted to mention, uh, last week was the Minnesota GIS LIS conference, which is sort of our version of, of WLIA. And one thing I noted uh, frequently was people's frustrations with what is called MNIT or MINIT. So Minnesota recently went through sort of IT consolidation exercise and now there is the IT mothership called MNIT. So ironically, it's kind of a cloud of itself in and out there. Uh, but people had a lot of frustrations for really two reasons. One, a lot of GIS people got pulled up into the sort of the minute mothership. And what that meant was somebody who was a GIS technician uh, and knew Department of Agriculture or Pollution Control Agency, they've suddenly been sort of pulled into this larger organization and asked to start sort of servicing state agencies at a whole, which, fine, which works fine for certain things like, say, email or file services that are ubiquitous across just about everything. Um, but GIS, whether you think spatial is special or not, there is something particular about a GIS expert who fundamentally understands how to approach the problems in the space that he's working, whether it's transportation or natural resources. So that was a frustration they echoed. The other one was the cloud, the cloud, the cloud. So I had shown some really great tools, CardoDB in particular, one of them. And afterwards, a lot of people came up and said, this is great. They had some ideas on how they might use it, but they couldn't uh, because Minute prevented them from putting anything into the cloud. Uh, even public data, they sort of had the perception that I couldn't take, as a MnDOT, a Minnesota DOT employee, I couldn't take public data from MnDOT and put it into CardoDB while I was on the job. Um, if I wanted to do that on the weekend, on my own time as sort of regular Joe citizen, then I could do that. So I don't know how things are sort of ferreting out here in Wisconsin, uh, but I just wanted to communicate those couple of things that, for them anyway right now, makes it a little more difficult for them to start experimenting So over the last month or so, uh, while I was preparing for this presentation, I um, had been listening to the Phosphor D conference that was out in Portland uh, back in September, the free and open source for geospatial. Uh, about 900 attendees from all over the world attended that. And as I was watching those live streams and as I came back from our own GIS, Minnesota GIS conference, uh, there were a number of quotes that that came up that really kind of resonated with me um, that I think really kind of helped frame what I wanted to talk about here. Uh, 
So the first one, open source is free like a puppy, not free like a beer. Um, so, right, you get a beer for free, hey, that's great, I drank my beer. You get a puppy for free, there's care and feeding, you gotta get the shots, you need tags, he's gotta go for a walk, right? So, it's not free. Um, there is some participation required uh, in that. So, to some degree, open source is not for lazy people who uh, have no interest in understanding and working with the other people who are also using this software. It's an approach to solutions. Again, we go back to uh, this is not an all or nothing proposition. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's uh, pieces that fit uh, where they need to in your organization. So free is not free. The real cost of a puppy lies in what the costs you want to bear is to maintain your operations. Um, that cost is either going to be money or it's going to be time. Um, and a few other things about free, just to note, uh, you know, free and open terms often get kind of get tossed around a little bit, uh, intermingled, um, but they're very much not the same thing, right? Google is free, but it's certainly not open, um, in that there is a pretty substantial terms of service that you have agreed to, um, knowingly or not, to use all of their services. And that's great, they provide great things so long as you understand why you get to use this stuff at no obvious cost. Um, time or money, right? Your time has got value to it. Um, you can pay for software solutions, whether they're proprietary traditional solutions. You can pay for commercial open source solutions. In other words, folks who are going to support those tools and help you out. Um, or you can take your time and download some of these tools and work with them yourselves. And that's part of the point is this gives you options to look at things, test things out, kick the tires. Um, and if it's something you're not interested in or doesn't fit well or you don't want to run yourself, you can switch back to investing in someone else to help you with that. Um, Google, uh, again, their, their terms of service, uh, Google geocoding displayed on a non Google map. I know there are some folks who use GeoMoose here and that comes kind of out of the box with the ability to do Google address lookups. The QJS desktop tool now also lets you do Google geocoding. Um, but the terms are pretty specific that they say using the, if you're going to use the Google geocoding service, you have to display those results on a Google map. So if you're not, you're a criminal going to jail and we'll see you in February hopefully. And the promise of the cloud, right? Are you really an IT shop? Do you want to spend your time managing software installations, operating system upgrades, hardware? Um, that's part of what this cloud is, this magical cloud is reported to help out is your organization is intended to manage a city or deal with the challenges of 
natural resources in the state. Your job is not really to maintain servers. So if you dive into open source um, and you pick a project and you say, uh, what if I pick something that looks really great and then it gets abandoned and here I am kind of stuck with this thing and nobody else to help me out anymore. Um, so that effect ne has never happened before in the proprietary software line of business where things you've invested in one day go away due to a variety of reasons. So find something that has a good community um, as best you can and work with it. Um, knowing that technology is always changing, always moving, and um, that applies to open source just in so much as it does everything else. And I guess what I see as still a little bit of a challenge in the open source, the community side of open source, um, is, to be honest, some of the core believers um, and their attitude can be a little standoffish, a little snobbish. Um, I remember at the Phosphor G2012, which we hosted in Minneapolis, um, we were looking for keynote speakers at the time um, GOIQ, GOIQ, and GeoCommons had just been purchased by Esri, and I thought, well, let's get Andrew Turner in here to give us a presentation on how he's going to bring open source sort of into the Esri culture. Um, that did not happen. Um, Esri was not invited to give a keynote address at the Free and Open Source Software Foundation. Personally, I think largely because of um, philosophical beliefs. So it's open cool, but if you're not cool, it's not open. Um, it's getting better, but that's still very much a piece of it. <coughs> Try things, fail fast, and move on. Um, Sean Gillis at Mapbox said this at Phosphor G. Uh, one thing that open source really does let you do is um, download this stuff, give it a try, see if it works. If it doesn't, kick it to the curb and move on to the next thing. Because trying and failure and iteration of these things uh, should be uh, a daily part of, of your workings. Uh, once you settle on the best solution, uh, you, move, you move forward with that. Uh, but open source lets you do that exactly. Get these things, try them out, see which ones fail, you move on to other opportunities. Um, it really is at the core of a lot of innovation. All these companies, Skybox, Skype, Instagram, UK Ordnance Survey, all of these organizations have part of their technology built on an open source stack. Um, UK Ordnance Survey, 500 million records running in post-GIS um, at a speed and a, and a, a frequency that just can't be kept up with, with other sort of typical database providers. Uh, this is just a quick example. We'll see if this runs. Um, if you can see it, those clouds, you can see these are moving. This is a video taken with Skybox so from a satellite. So this is video, live video from space. But this isn't live, but um, Skybox uses a number of tools, open source tools, uh, Hadoop in particular, to deal with their big data problems. Uh, Skybox, earlier this year, was just acquired by Google. Um, their capabilities and their innovation stem from using open source tools. Uh, GitHub, this sort of serves open source, but also sprang from open source. And this is really that social aspect that I was talking about. Um, people like doing work together. Even if you're a software developer and you sort of tend to do your work sort of with your head down, your headphones on, um, there's still this community and this social aspect of, here's this piece I've developed. Anybody can take it and look at it and improve it um, and pass it back to the, pass it back to the community. Jobs. Right? These are just a few jobs that I saw posted in the last month um, on various job boards. 
Apple, Red Cross, Snap-on Tools, uh, U.S. Corporation, all of these people looking for GIS folks with some exposure um, to open source software tools. First law of holes, if you find yourself in one, stop digging. <laughs> um, if you have a bevy of software that you paid for, um, and some of it isn't doing what you need it to, um, maybe you shouldn't be paying for it. <coughs> maybe you should look at things out there that are gonna do what you need to do. Um, so again, just kind of question those things that you're investing in, and if they're invested in because of habit, or if they're invested in um, because of lack of interest in, in trying to see what's out there. Um, Eric Gunderson, CEO at Mapbox, says we're making this play based on open source and open data, and this is working. We're taking clients from them. And he's referring to Google. So Mapbox is a company that really stemmed out of doing, initially, um, consulting business using open source tools to service their clients. Um, last year, earlier this year, they received another $12 million in investor funding to continue to build their business. And there are people who look at the cost of something like Mapbox, which provides fully custom, uh, fully stylable base maps and other services built on OpenStreetMap plus your own data. Um, and looking at the effectiveness of using that, the effectiveness of using Google and the costs to sign up for Google, say from a, an enterprise standpoint. Um, and people have stood up and taken notice. Two years ago, Foursquare um, moved everything from Google to Mapbox. National Park Service is doing work with the Leaflet Library Maps, uh, because they have full control over how these maps are given up here. Something really, I think, significant that's come into the open source world um, relatively recently is uh, the notion of a project curator. So there had always been sort of the champion or the primary developer of a piece of software that was out there available, say, on GitHub. Uh, Linux, you know, Red Hat maybe is a, a good example. But in the GIS world in particular, um, as of late there have been a lot of companies emerging that are there to essentially act as the curator, um, the primary champion of one or more sets of software, and they've built a business around it, uh, providing services and support. Boundless takes things like GeoServer, OpenLayers, uh, Geocache, and PostGIS, puts it into their suite called OpenGeo, which is a very much a parallel to ArcGIS server as far as its capabilities and offerings. Mapbox, we just talked about, CardoDB, provides really awesome and fast, fast visualization on the web. Again, built on a set of probably 15 to 20 different open source tools that they've pulled together into a single project called CardoDB. If you want to download all that, run it on your system, you can still do that. It's all open source. CardoDB would prefer you pay them 49 bucks a month to let them do all that heavy lifting. But these are some options that are available to you to look at the stuff that is open source, but it's still commercially viable and has support. This was just an example, tile stream, tile stanch, um, wind shaft, those are a few open source projects available on GitHub that Mapbox got the guys took and provide that and offer that as a service. So the point is you can sign up for their free account, test things out, decide, yeah, this works for us, and then either sign up with them for a subscription or download the software and run it as your own service. This was on the news last, excuse me, last night, CBS um, Evening News. This is their big, scary Ebola map. 
Um, but the point is, this is Cardo DB. This is not sort of what you might think of as would have otherwise been sort of a map provider from sort of the usual suspects. Brian Timoney, sort of a large contributor and a big voice in the GIS uh, community, tweeted out that these other folks uh, need to pay attention. If someone like CBS Evening News is taking a 20-foot screen and showing Cardo DB on it, um, that's something people should pay attention to. So Esri and open source, where, where are they in all this? Um, Eddie Pickle, CEO of Boundless, had this to say in an earlier blog posting of his, um, that their use of the word open can be, in his words, a bit uh, misleading. And his point was that uh, it's not helpful to a geospatial industry that's still trying to catch up with the rest of the IT industry in the use of real open source software. So the rest of the IT industry, you can see the perspective there is that piece of GIS is part of the IT industry. And as I was sort of alluding to earlier, um, open source is a fundamental piece of the IT industry. So open source software licensing promotes rapid adoption, superior interoperability, better collaboration among developers, a greater universe of software testers, and greater control for the enterprise using the software you've installed and are working with a set of software and the people you're paying to support you with that are no longer doing that to your satisfaction um, with a single vendor solution you don't have very many options um, if you want to just say you're sick of boundless and you find some other person who's going to support your geo server infrastructure you get to keep all your stuff it's someone else who's going to help you better manage that So Esri has more than 200, this is my wordiest slide, I promise. Esri has more than 200 projects on GitHub, but how many of them are sample applications or frameworks that only work with their proprietary offerings? They've got a bunch of great JavaScript libraries that are open source, but they only work for ArcGIS Online, or they only work for ArcGIS Server, which is fine, um, but you begin to sort of diminish a little bit of the value of saying, this is open source, do what you want with it but it's only gonna still work with our stuff. You can't use it on your own. So that said, GIS, or uh, Esri is sort of moving what seems to be in the right direction. Um, they've released a set of GIS tools for Hadoop, which again are GIS tools that work with Hadoop. No Esri software is required to work on these things. They have a large presence on GitHub. Uh, their Esri leaflets and their Esri bootstrap work um, is pretty great. That's all, again, um, pretty platform agnostic. Their GeoIQ and GeoLoki operations have really, uh, as they spun up these East and West Coast research and development laboratories, um, they have really seem to have sort of stepped up a true open source presence. And they've opened their GeoServices API. Um, so anybody who wants to implement it as a provider can do that. Um, and their file geodatabase specification was, was made available several years ago. So something like QGIS can now work along with ArcGIS Desktop to simultaneously work with your personal, or rather your file geodatabases. So they're, they're coming. Enterprise licensing agreement. Um, these things are very cost effective, right? It's, State of Minnesota has one, um, allowing all agencies to work with most ESRI products without an additional cost. Um, uh, Michael Turner at a uh, consulting company called AppGeo out of Boston. Some of you may know him or have worked with AppGeo. Uh, at GSLIS, he said that the enterprise licensing agreement is, is sort of the death knell of innovation. And while he might have been exaggerating a little bit, Getting this license um, sort of gives you the first thing that you're going to try, and if it works well enough, you'll probably just use it. Um, so my point is just uh, just because you have an ELA, don't let that prevent you from looking with 
at other tools that can work alongside um, your investment. This is one of my favorite. If you have staff that does not want to learn new things, the problem is not the new things. Right? People get entrenched. People get lazy. People um, get bored with their jobs. Uh, but Paul's point was the open source sort of avenue allows you to look out there and try new things. And this is a two-way street. If you, as a staff member at Minnesota Department of Agriculture, really want to test out and work with something like CardoDB, um, then your manager is really supposed to work for you to try to get you access to the things that you know are going to help you solve these problems. So where's the best fit for a lot of these tools for you? Um, start with something small. Download uh, OpenGeo from Boundless. Install it on your local PC if your IT guy lets you. Um, fill with some of their examples. Look at the PostGIS database. Take QGIS and load a shapefile into PostGIS. Just uh, play around with this stuff. And then build from there. See if something like the file geo database access works for your ArcGIS desktop and however much you pay for each of those desktop licenses um, for QGIS. I know Andy Schwartz is now at the Department of Health. He was at the City of Sun Prairie and they, after working with QGIS for a while, cut. We used to have three ArcGIS desktop licenses there. The city stopped paying maintenance on over half of its desktop seats. Right. So, there you go. Um, another piece where this really fits in really well is quick short term projects. If you want to spin up some servers to digest a bunch of data, maybe generate a bunch of tiles, um, or do some analysis on a large data set, fire yourself up a couple of post GIS databases, crank through the data, get your results, shut them down. You don't need to stand up new instances of SQL Server or Oracle or ArcSDE plus whatever um, to do some of this ad hoc work where you need a, a number of resources for a short period of project. For smaller places, use the tools that work best for you. For larger places, think of Enterprise GIS, not Enterprise Esri. You should think of, you have your Enterprise GIS and how does Esri fit into it? How does Esri work with the other tools that you're going to choose to use? So tomorrow, we'll actually do some uh, some actual demos of a number of these tools interacting with ArcGIS Server and ArcGIS Online. Uh, ArcGIS Desktop Online, Arc to Earth, which is a really great tool for bridging between open source and ArcGIS. GeoServer and PostGIS Tile Mill which has a new name now called Mapbox Studio, uh, CardoDB, and then another tool called MapFeeder that we developed which works with GeoServer, ArcGIS, etc. We're kind of running tight on time here. So hybrid stacks, right? Again, ArcGIS Desktop plus QGIS. Places all over the world have proven these things live in harmony and can work together on the same data. Uh, PostGIS and GeoServer publishing to or working with your ArcGIS online account. A GeoCat Bridge for taking data from your ArcGIS desktop and publishing that out into PostGIS and GeoServer. Open layers and their 3D Cesium libraries and map box. So, to kind of wrap things up, um, <clears throat> all that said, a couple other questions for you just to mull around. Um, if the curator of a particular piece of open source software does most of the heavy lifting and they're clearly the most, the, the primary developer of that tool, does it matter to you if that software code is open? Uh, if the services that you're using uh, are open and reasonably priced, and if your data 
can come in and come back out in an easy fashion, do you really care if the software code running that engine is open source? And finally, I refer you to this URL, which I'm sure everyone will type into their iPhones as soon as I'm done talking. Um, moving to the middle, right? Because that's, that's the reality. There are things you're going to use that the Esri solutions do very, very well at. Um, and it's an investment you made. But there's other things you can use open source tools for um, that kind of fill in those pieces that really allow you to, again, do your job in the manner that you need to do it, not the manner of a single source software solution. That's it. So are there any questions at all? Some. Andy, is it worth mentioning for the next generation, MongoDB? Uh, the Polaris guys just gave us a presentation and that whole app is going on MongoDB. Yeah, so we could talk about everything that's out there. Um, I personally haven't worked a lot with MongoDB, um, but there's CouchDB, there's MongoDB, um, server-side JavaScript, Node.js, so there's a large number of things out there. Um, I can't speak to, to MongoDB, but a lot of these things, again, kind of geospatial emerging from non-GIS avenues. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>